the interesting dynamic at the start when Martin told, told you about affinities, it was like, you know, didn't really, kind of a bit abstract, right? I mean, it, and, and we, I've done this a lot. I've been at Plexi like Eddie months, and you know, I've seen that with a lot of customers that we talk to. When they first hear about that abstract concept, it's it's difficult to apply it to the physical world. So it's good for us to go through, yeah, yeah, show you about the optics, yeah, right. so you get it. Yeah. Um, to me, it's always, you know, I've seen this a lot. Whenever I see an abstract and I can't apply it to the physical, I don't know what the, I don't know what it is. I need to be able to apply those two together. So here, you can't, probably can't see it very well because we have these beautiful little gray lines here that, that show the, um, the affinity um, topology that we've created. Now, the importance of the affinities is you want to be able to, in your network, apply some treatment policies to your traffic. If you can do that, you can direct the traffic better than you can if we just randomly build uh, a topology for you. So that affinity basically allows you to do it manually if you want to, and dynamically and automatically um, feeding in from a bunch of sources. I'm going to show you a bit about our architecture of how Plexi Control works. First of all, I'm just going to build off on what Martin said about affinities just to show how we describe them. And I'm going to have to clear some of your stuff out of the way, Martin. I was hoping I could leave it up there. You can, I, uh, you can flip could, it around. I could point to it. Oh, OK. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Don't, you, I was warned about this. Let's break. Don't break the Don't break the whiteboard, yes. Outside. We may want to flip back to Very yes. his stuff. And don't go too far, Martin, because I'm sure we're going to need you at some point. Okay. So the way we view affinities is we want to essentially identify some traffic on the network. And you need to give me some high-level parameters to identify that traffic. The concept is once I've you given me those high-level parameters about identifying the traffic, you want to give me your, the treatment perspective you have for that traffic across the network. Now let me draw a little bit of an architecture so it makes sense where we're talking to you. Ring-wise, it's a quick version of the ring. Imagine a small little plexi ring. There is a plexi control here somewhere. All of the switches are talking to it via a broker. And that's, that's an interesting thing. Building a new network product. I've been involved in a lot of networking products over my time and a lot of vendors, building a new network product today gives you the opportunity to do things 21st century wise from a management orchestration perspective. And I'm talking about here we essentially have ActiveMQ broker that all the switches talk to to push all these messages in. Martin talked about pushing MAC addresses up to it. That's how they get there. So they have a path to it. This is kind of our internal interface, but it's it's worthy of talking about it um, from this perspective. I hate to get all stupid low layer again. What is that connection back to the broker? Is it part of the fiber path, or is it a standard Ethernet? That path? Is, yeah, it's, I mean, it's you just got to put make sure it's IP connectivity to it. But you've got to uh, you've got to assume that there's IP connectivity from at least several of the nodes. Everybody in the event of failure. It's a management port in every node, and that yeah. needs to be on, on the main. So you either build an external management, or you let it go across the. You can do in-band or out-of-band. Yes. yes, exactly. So it needs this connection to be able to push up information to, to, the, to the control. This is Plexi Control Core, as we call it. The little broker JMS connection gets the data off there. So that's how it loads. And the broker is a separate box or just a component on the... The broker like can be distributed. ActiveMQ, horizontally distributed um, messaging layer. So how do you get masses of messages come up? You use modern... Um, technology for it, yeah. which is what we built it to. Yeah. to it's all software. It's be just a bunch of yeah. We had one of these interesting questions early on from development team. Do we support SNMP in this box? It's my favorite question. What do you think the answer was? The right answer for now is yes, but there needs to be something better in the future. Yeah. So that's exactly what we've done, luckily. Glad you said that. <laughs> so <laughs> these things do push out SNMP. Think like a product manager. There's SNMP here, <laughs> but there's a much better way than this, which I'm going to talk about when we go through the architecture. Before I go too far in the architecture, you just got to get a feel for it. I'm defining affinities now. The point of the defining the affinities is um, here we have a thing called a fitting engine. Great name. This builds the topology for the network. 
This is a PhD mathematical science um, algorithmic engine that takes in the essentially a traffic profile of the network. So we're monitoring the traffic. We know how much traffic is going between this guy and this guy. And we can build a topology based on the amount of traffic we see without knowing anything about that traffic. Okay. So it's essentially so that. That sounds like math that's a lot fancier than Dayton. Myers math, rivers being <laughs> right? That's like super fancy. We got PhD mathematics in a little box yeah. with an F on it. We got more Greek letters. Yeah, the little F, the little F does the computation. So. That's awesome. It's in, the thing is, from as a user of this, you don't have to understand the maths, which is very important. You're you're looking at it for from the affinity perspective. But it's important to realize that if you have not defined any of these affinities, we're still building a traffic profile based on the topology. The fitting engine builds that. The way you typically deploy this, first time you deploy it, you put the switches out, you've got it all um, communicating, all, all the hosts on it communicating. You will do a first time fit, as we say. You'll push the topology to it. Let's say it's, an, it's within an hour of you installing this network. We don't have much of a history on the traffic at that point. We have an hour's worth of history. The next day, we've got a day's worth. Maybe we've got a better idea of the traffic profiles. The next day, on day two, I'll run this fit again, and I'll recompute the topology based on the traffic profile that I now see. The important thing I'm saying this is, the affinity abstract thing that we were talking at the start, I haven't defined anything to enable this to work. And let me give you a couple of examples of why, why this is important. Is that if I am seeing, let me draw another note here, because it gets better with that example. If I am seeing, and a lot of traffic between these guys. That's saying they're getting to the point of exceeding the capacity of these direct links. Okay? When I compute that topology, I know here, this controller knows that actually there's very little traffic between here and here. So when it recomputes the topology, it's going to push some of the um, traffic flows this direction because there's very little capacity being used. Spatial reuse, basically. Are you exporting, are, are you taking flow data? Is that where you're getting your analytics? We're, we're taking, we what look at every packet. Um, we are not necessarily doing it, diving into the flows to be able to build that traffic match. It's more of a summary of the traffic to build that. Okay, so packets per second. So that's it. Okay. And there's, then no, there's, a, there's no application awareness from that right. unless it's been classified. Yeah, it's somewhere. just this is unaware of any affinities right. or any affinities. At, at this point, I haven't defined any affinity. I've told nothing. It's classic rear view mirror monitoring. I'm looking at what happened last week to build my topology. How can you know what's going to happen tomorrow if you're looking at last week's traffic? You can't. There's got to be some input from someone somewhere to give us a better topology. That's where affinities become interesting because now you can tell us. And when I mean you, you don't have to manually do this. You can tell us from your orchestration automation systems that tomorrow at 12, I've got a big backup. Um, you might want to get some bandwidth for me. There is a long list of interesting um, dynamics we can think of to how you can build better topology. I'm building on a new tenant that needs to be isolated. So something as simple as I've hit a threshold at 80%, if I go any higher, I'm going to start degrading and everything is going to start backing off, spin up another lambda, right? You could do that. You could do that. Absolutely. I would think that'd be pretty attractive. Pretty like a, yeah, I mean, the first one you came up with, it's a, you know, it's a, I think it's a good use case for where you may want to actually re recapture the topology. Now, this first topology calculation did everything. We would expect maybe day two or day three, you don't necessarily want to change everything. You're tweaking it a little bit. So over time, you're going to adjust. Say, oh, there's no one's using this. Let me push more um, flows this way. I think the cooler use case is what I said earlier, which is we quit re-architecting the network, whether it's virtually or through lambdas or physically through re-architection. Architection, that's work. <coughs> Instead, use the data that we're grabbing here and just move the host. Yes. Move the host closed. The other way of thinking about it. That, right. that, that makes more sense to me. Yeah. If, if it's the right use case. In, in heavy multi tenant environments, it won't work. In standard data centers, that makes all the sense in the world. Yeah. So, yeah that, so, so, one of the very cool use cases is the control, plexing control, can actually start to advise where's the best place to 
put my next set of, you know, orchestrate my thing and can start to communicate with the orchestration. Well, right? th there's another dynamic to that actually, which I generally, my understanding of the way you decide to move a VM is generally based on the, the physical resources of the host, the memory, CPU availability. That's one of the criteria where you're going to put it. Maybe the availability is here at this point. The, the engine that decides to move a, a virtual machine here does, obviously doesn't know anything about the network. The thing that we can do, once they've decided to move there, we can now modify the topology to match the fact you moved it there. So instead of you worrying about where it's going, we'll fix the network to actually match it. That's a different in, paradigm. But you can flip that. Because we know this exactly, we can actually tell your orchestration as well, we prefer you actually put it behind that switch somewhere. Yeah, we, the way we do workload placement today is, you know, CPU memory availability, right? That's kind of the, the models. But we, we could actually add the network dimensions. And that's because we don't have a lot of control over That's right. The we don't have the data, right? We don't have... Uh, right. All right, so let me, let me talk affinities a little bit so we get there. So the concept of affinity is the way to define it. We want you to be able to define something abstract and then apply it to the visual. So we've created, and you, I'm showing it on the screen, essentially a concept of creating identifiers identifies to be able to identify the traffic on the, on, the, on the wire when we see it on our switches. The identifier can be a range of things. Um, it can be as concrete as a MAC address VLAN pair, IP address, node, um, VLAN, VXLAN, DSCP mark, essentially anything that we can do to identify the traffic. We take these identifiers, what I think of in terms of groups of identifiers, and group them into something we call uh, an affinity group. That's what you're seeing on the screen there. The, the orange blobs are what we call affinity groups. And I've created this affinity group with these identifiers. Maybe, the, maybe in this case I've identified this mode but, you know, by node names. Simon, Bob, and Derek, whose name I can spell now. So there we enter. I haven't told anything about it at this point. I've just identified that is a group that's interesting to me. For our affinities, you now need to give me some treatment policies across the network. Something interesting to do with it. So we create a thing we call a link, which can be bidirectional, can be unidirectional. You may want treatment in one direction different to the other direction. So it's up to you. Let's say I've created in this case a unidirectional link. Where's that going? It's going to nowhere right now. It's going to go somewhere soon. I've got another couple of identifiers that I've identified another couple of um, machines. Call them A and B for one of another in another affinity group. Now here is where the, the really important thing was, now I want to define my treatment for this traffic. So on here, we have a, because of the nature of the Plexi ring, we have some really interesting things we can do with the way we um, deploy the topologies across the networks. Um, three, I'll, I'll talk about two of the main attributes that are interesting, the easiest ones to get. First one is isolation. So my policy for this is isolate. And guess what that does? When we do the compute of the topology, the first thing we're going to do is make sure Simon, Bob, and Derek have an isolated link to A and B. And that isolated means no other traffic will traverse that particular port on the Broadcom to that particular port. So we've got a lot of residual traffic flowing around. We make sure none of that traffic goes across that physical link. And that's, you know, that's basically a layer one separation of the traffic, just based on you defining that policy. Now, here's the fun part. So let's say A and B is here. Let's say B moves. We can basically make sure the computation can say, oh, actually, I really need to use that link for B now, because he's over there. As a user, and this, this is really interesting as well, as a user, I don't need to care where Simon, Bob, and Derek are or A and B is. I just define the policy. Plexi control determines where they are. Now, I'm not a big fan of, you know, I expect most of you, when you're on networks, you don't memorize MAC addresses and things like that. We, we build topologies based on forwarding packets in MAC addresses. So how can you tell me about Simon, Bob, and Derek I need to know their MAC address, essentially. Well, Plexi Control needs to know what's the MAC address of these things. And this is where our architecture really comes into play, is the orchestration layer able to learn, essentially, uh, user terms for the nodes on their networks in the terms that they have, as in, I know, host names, 
um, VM names, VM host names, IP addresses, things like that. But for Plexi Control to work, we need to get that data from somewhere. So let me drop that out and I will talk more on it. Does that make sense on affinity groups? I mean, there, another good affinity group, actually I was, I was going to say the second one. We can do uh, hop count affinity. Hop count means give me the shortest path across this. Now it's very valid, assume, you, assume you've got a data center with a lot of traffic, I may have a ton of traffic going across here. So it's very valid to use this path for additional traffic to get there. But I may have a latency sensitive application. If you tell me in terms of affinity that these nodes are latency sensitive, I will make sure their traffic goes on their shortest path. But all this stuff that's not latency sensitive, I'll send them around this one. Go ahead. I got a question, maybe I just dropped some bits along there. You said when B moves, control notices that the MAC address is now in a different place. Yeah. How does the topology get adjusted? Well, there, there's a few things um, that we do. First of all, actually it comes from how do we know what B was in the first place? It's the first thing I need to talk about. So in terms of architecture, this is control. Control has interfaces to third party boxes. So that's one of my interfaces. Third party. One of these third parties just so happens to be VMware, of course. So we do a connection to VMware and we ask VMware, please tell me about all your VMs. So it gives me vhost information, the VM um, containers within the vhost, the MAC addresses, IP addresses, um, vSwitch information, the port group, VLANs, everything we can get from this particular one, maybe a vCenter. So it's a vMotion trigger rather than a Mac uh, on a different switch. So my question is, um, what type of activity? Because if I have vMotion going on all over the place, am I constantly flushing new topologies? Do you have a lot of vMotion going on? Um, actually, I had a customer that was doing what I would call triangular DRS stupidity, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, where that they put them all in the same priority group, and so the whole class body moved to the next hypervisor yeah. every 20 seconds, and they finally every noticed 20 that, seconds? <laughs> and they noticed these 40, 40 VMs moving because they had <coughs> only a 10% degradation in performance. What was the restriction that had the VMs moving that often? Like what? It was the granularity. Was there like a gremlin running through the data center, smashing <laughs> servers left and right? Was that no, hyperbole? It was the whole class body would move, the CPU would spin up, VMware DRS would notice it and decide to move the whole priority. Group. But no, there is a use case for this <laughs> actually. The <laughs> and, and the use case is actually VDI with, with DRS. So you start your day with nothing but server load, and as your, as your client starts spinning up, DRS starts allocating resources. And this is the classic model around DRS. You start at 8 or 6 a.m. with nothing, you end at 5 with a lot, and then it pairs itself down by 8 again. Yeah. So there, there is a use case for so, this. Well, I'll tell you what we do in that case. So um, we built the topology. Um, Simon's talking to A um, and B over here. B moves it over here. The first thing that happens is because we've built this topology for traffic that we have to find outside of this connection, it will actually just we'll use one of those topologies right away. So B will immediately just continue to talk to S. Doesn't it doesn't need any changes to topology. Everyone's got connections to everyone. So what would happen is that B would, would go on. When I was talking initially about what if we don't know any affinities, we build that topology, we balance the traffic on that topology, B would just go on one of those paths. Now, if, it's, if you need that preferential treatment for B, though, like you need that hop count, then we need a bit of a tweak from the fitting engine to tell us to change something. What fitting engine does in terms of, say, so you can see it on the switch perspective. Uh, the fitting engine is essentially configuring each of these switches. So this is probably number one um, important use case for Plexi environment. You don't go down to these switches and start configuring TCAM entries. Plexi control does that for you. So when it refits this, because it's got to do that, it's just going to change that TCAM entry. But it's got to do that. Even if it doesn't do that, it doesn't matter. It's still going to, the data's still going to get there. So today, today, today is manual, right? It, it's a manual action. It's not like you know, we know if something moves and automatically go and push down the topologies. Today, it's a it's an operator triggered event. But it so could it, it, it could be automated. automated. <laughs> well, VMware uh, is not automatically alerting it and triggering a fit. It doesn't trigger. Yeah, it, you can set it up to do that. You can set it up to detect a, a trigger, run a script, and, and, and run a fit, or you could have a scheduled fit, and you know. 
it, we think about it like defragging a hard drive. Like, you know, how often do you want to do it, right? You want to do it every hour, do it every hour, right? Just to set a script to kind of run the fit operation. If you know that's your dynamic, you can do that. Yeah, if you're the, I mean, immediately the traffic continues to the other. If you, if you desperately need this to be uh, recalculated in the fit, terms of the fit, then, then we can plug into other things. We have a lot of, the third party areas, it's like any vendor when you're dealing with third parties, there's 1,000 third parties we need to work with, and we have done it with about six or seven right now where we've actually built third party connectors to harvest information. So probably one of the most interesting ones you've done, and if you um, Google Plexi, you'll see a, a, a press announcement from a company called Boundary that does performance monitoring um, across environments. They've got a, basically a cloud system where they, you can deploy their meters in your environment. They've got a cloud system where they push all the data up and you can then look at your data traffic profiles in terms of applications. We did a plug-in with them where we pulled all of that conversational performance information and we turned it into affinities. So from a customer perspective, you're using Boundary, you know all about your application workflows, it's there in Plexi automatically. So, so I need to make sure I'm understanding. So we're taking we put policy in the controller, controllers proactively instantiating the flow tables, right? So Mac tables, CCAM tables, whatever it needs right. to do. Sure. So yeah. single table, multiple tables, Cartesian, some of those problems. Are you, is it all a single table? And then how many parameters am I able to deal with? So, and then action, is that going to be a lambda or a physical interface, right? It depends where, the, where it needs to, where the data, first of all, from the lambda perspective, if it needs to be on a lambda, it will put it on a lambda. If it's out of an access port, then it will direct the traffic the way it is. Tables, table stuff, talk to Martin. He's at the back there, hiding. Okay. <laughs> There's multiple tables. There's lots of yeah, As a user, I'm the software guy as a user, I don't need to worry about Tables, right? Yeah, well, and I guess just broader for the for the for an operator, what can they what can they take actions on, right? So we what, oh, you know, L two, L three, L four. We do any rewriting in there? I mean, some of the same problems that you know we're kind of talking about. So so in th there's really, I mean, ultimately, the only limit that exists is what can the chipset do for us, right? right? And so all the things that you you think that you can currently do with your chipsets. I'm not saying that we have every single one of them implemented today, right? But those are those are all possibilities of us treating traffic and affinities and what we can use as classifiers. So it, it, we, we're essentially on the controller side. There's no limit because it's pure software. Oh, sure. It's it's truly in the hardware side is how far in a packet can we look and what kind of actions can we then you know, you know, take based on that. So you got Trident Plus. So you're what? Trident, Trident Plus. Today, Trident Plus. It's about 2,000. But remember, right, not, not every single one of these ends up in a TCAM entry, right? I mean, those topologies, those forwarding topologies, right, the, the basic forwarding topologies, none of them end up in TCAM entry. Those are purely us deciding how we populate MAC and IP forwarding tables. Are we going to get to see a demo of the main one? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going through the demo, but it's No, like, I don't want to write it. I just want to make sure it sounds cool. But, well, what I'm showing here is I've basically created a, um, an affinity policy. I've got a, some auth service, I've got storage box, and I've created an isolation policy between them. Um, the key thing is how do I, you know, I, I, I basically describe how do I know what these are. We learned it through one of the third parties, be it VMware, Boundary, or, or any other variety. We are, as a product, API-wise, we're very much REST API-based um, with event monitoring pieces, but we do do some of the SNMP stuff if you want to do that as well. You can, I'm showing, I'm slowly drawing up all the interfaces here. It's important to have a lot of interfaces for a product like this, because we need to both be able to integrate very seamlessly with um, the orchestration systems that are out there. And I'm using that term orchestration system to mean about 150 different types of management system. <laughs> it's the best word I can think of right now. The manager and manager type systems that we need to talk to. Um, and also you can, you can basically SSH to a switch if you want to. Our goal, my goal specifically in the world is to avoid you ever needing to do this SSH to a switch. Because I can give you, you want to manage this network, you basically manage it from control. And you need to do it automatically so we can interface with those orchestration systems. But also, from an enterprise perspective, customers need to be able to use it at a high level without worrying about things like that. So we have a REST interface. So when we're, when we're building, when this 
her first comes online. The switches talk through this broker to the core, and there is, oh, surprise, surprise, there is a little database here. I knew there was another picture. And it builds the topology model within the database. Topology model in terms of everything about the switches, the ports, what is attached to those ports, MAC addresses on ports, the status of a, a link, etc., is pushed up to Plexi Control. So as a user, when you want to look at it, you basically can use one of our control interfaces and essentially uh, orchestrate uh, your network switches without going to each individual switch. Now, if you've got a, a real low-level troubleshooting problem, you can still go directly to them. And there's an interface here as well. And another one. So you see there's a lot of REST interface here. So this GUI, what I'm showing here, this is every action that I do on this GUI essentially interfaces directly. Yep, that's what I'm doing. Thank you. This interfaces directly with the, um, through the REST interface to the database. The importance of doing that is when you've got interface, when you have multiple interfaces to talk to a system, it becomes complicated. Really, there's only one underlying. And so from an automated perspective, if you're a customer that's a REST, um, automated-based customer, you can build it all yourself. and allows us to build a lot of high-level stuff. Now, the problem with the demo is that the laptop's down here, and I, you know, I basically have to sit on the ground to move things around. So that, that's my excuse for not doing too much so far. So you can see in this view, I have basically, I'm showing our affinity group view. So as a user, you can stick to this if you want. Just build your deployment. You can basically create a role, a user role that just bring, builds affinities. They don't have to worry about the physical network topologies to do that. But Plexi Control does need to know about the physical topologies. And if it wants to build affinities, it needs to know what things are and where they are. So we have another view here, basically our network view. So what I'm showing you here is, this is interesting because we have, this is, a simulation, obviously, I don't really have a Plexi switch anywhere here, so I'm basically simulating uh, a Plexi environment, and I've simulated harvesting information from VMware. I've built a bunch of vhosts constructs. You see, these are like a little stack of vhosts. Actually, that's telling me it's got 10 vhosts, 28 VMs. Yeah, Simon, Simon, this is the actual tool, though, that you, you would use to manage the product, right? Right. Right, so the simulation is on the back end. The tool is talking to the simulation. The, the Plexi Control in this case is actually running on a VM on my Mac. Plexi Control thinks it's talking to switches. So did you draw that? We've tri we tricked yourself? it. It's not really a switch there, but it thinks it is, which is a great uh, you know, environment. We actually provide a simulator to customers, so you can actually simulate your entire network without ever touching hardware. You can do all these things. So, uh, yeah, so here I can basically build a topology of your network if you want. As long as you give me the right input to this. See what I've got here? I've got a, I've got a host, I've got a Cisco switch here, I've got a host off the Cisco switch, I've got a bunch of storage devices. But did, did you manually draw that? that yeah, this was, uh, this was automatically drawn. So we harvest, once we harvested all, actually there's an interesting way, dynamic of the way this works. <coughs> so we harvested from VMware, told us all about all the VMs and vhosts and everything. Okay. At that point that I've harvested, I don't know where those things are. Okay. VMware doesn't tell me which port on Plexi it's on. It just tells me, Essentially, there is the network credentials for it. So what happens in the network is when, so say this iSCSI, bo iSCSI zero box is here. When he first starts talking on the network, we see the MAC attachment for him. That MAC attachment ultimately is pushed up to Plexi Control. Plexi Control then does a hash match with that MAC address and the one I learned through the manager for that iSCSI box and automatically pil builds this. This is like a network link in our domain model that automatically populates it. So what you see happening, if you see these MAC attachments occurring dynamically, you actually see the network topology updating in real time and things appearing and jumping in the topology. Now, this is actually drawn automatically. So, so there's, a, there's a toolkit we use, a Java InfoSys toolkit, which is basically a, a, a dynamic topology building tool. So that builds it first time, and then I can do this nice operation that makes everybody, I can move things around, so I can actually, I don't quite like that topology it built, so I can move these guys up here, and pull this guy over here like that, and then I can save the layout. <laughs> first version, we didn't save the layout, so every time I did something, I added something, it redraw the thing again for me, so 
I had a lot of fun with that early on. So this just the interesting thing about that, this, this is just telling me only the things I harvested from those third parties. There may be other traffic on the network. If you haven't told me about it, again, it doesn't matter. It still continues to pass. This is the important stuff. And the reason I say that, and this is really important, if you have to harvest and think about every system and you've got a big network, it's too much. Focus on the ones that are important. The stuff that you don't harvest, maybe it's not so important. We'll still push that data around the topology. But we can do the preferential treatment for the stuff that you do harvest. And then it makes it, the abstract makes it maintainable. You told us there's a fully automated version of this. So you can just kind of set it and get it, and it'll figure out flows all on its own and dynamically route those and everything all on well, its own. There's a fully automated version of this. Yeah, I mean, this is this is fully automated version. It's a, but I mean, it'll actually, de it'll, it'll detect affinities. It'll dynamically choose affinities between yeah, let me show, let me show you what let me show you what happens in terms of affinities. So I'm back to the affinity view. Um, at some point, I basically uh, so I built a bunch of affinities. I built this one, which happens to have an isolation sensitive um, policy. Isolation sensitive means we're not going to put any traffic on that link unless there aren't any other links left. Isolation. I could very easily isolate my entire network and have nothing left if I just said isolate every single one into a group. So that's a sensitive thing, means don't be strict. Now, conceptually, we could do strict and then make it strict. Isolate means isolate. Does that make sense? So what I did is like, OK, I, I told it to do isolate. I haven't told it about anything to do with these guys. I know there's a, there's a host there, but it's not that important to me yet. Maybe it is tomorrow. Um, go ahead, Dan. So Simon, let's say you did want this whole process of affinities being automatically created. I'm going to get there, trust me. I'm quickly zooming there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can automate it. I've got an automation demo, so, so it's going to be, or I'll, I'll show you the power of the automation. But, but what I did it actually, so when I wanted to make this so on the topology, I basically ran this operation. It's a fit operation. So it basically asks me, what kind of operation do I want to do? Do I want a full or partial? Um, do I want to just process it? And this is really important, because let's say I built a bunch of affinities, and I want to check out what it'll look like on my network. I can just run the perform fit processing only, and it will basically compute the next topology, and then present it to me. I haven't done anything to the switches yet. It says, this is what I'm going to do if you push it. So if you like it, you push it. So this is what is really, I think, insanely cool about this, right? An affinity basically says, this stuff wants to talk to this other stuff in some way. And if you build like 40 of those infinities, right, um, describing endpoints in your network that have to talk to each other, the fit will reconcile, based on what's available in your network, the best possible way to meet the requirements of all of those traffic descriptions for you. And then configure all the switches for you. And then configure, <laughs> yes. and then configure the switches for you. And all you've done is say, process it. So I did that earlier. This is what I prepared earlier. So I ran that operation. Uh, and this is what it told me it was going to do. So a bit complicated, but essentially, let's, let's look at it in terms of the flows that I've got. So I've said, from my iSCSI box, so from the storage, show me the paths it's going to get to these two guys. So it's told me it's actually computed different paths for these. I guess auth machine 78, I think that says, is on, let's see if it gives me the answer, 76 actually. I can't even read that, I'm standing right next to it. Auth machine 7, I still need to auth machine 78 takes this path. What does that mean? It's some mnemonic there that means nothing to me. Actually, I can show it graphically, so why don't I take a look at it? Aha, it's a plexi ring view. So it's drawn me the topology saying, actually, to get from iSCSI to 76, it goes from here to here. Right. So I know, to, what's interesting now is, let's say you want to, yep, let's say you want to know um, how any device talks to any device. In this database topology model we've built, you can essentially ask it, tell me how device A talks to device C. And you can do it in terms of MAC address. So let's say all you know is the MAC address. You can say, tell me how this MAC communicates to that MAC. Or you can do it at a high level. 
if you've got a host name, tell me where this host is. Tell me how this host talks to that host, etc., etc. And I can see from a topology level, this shows me the skip perspective. Of course, I showed that traffic going direct. Actually, it went via this switch yeah. passively. The one that's grayed out. Go ahead. I'm having a bootstrap problem. Maybe I'm just being obtuse. But I have a whole set of questions here on bootstrapping this whole process that I have a chicken and egg problem in my head. Yeah. Um, most network admins that I know, I ask them, who's talking to who? And they go, I don't know. I what do you mean? I'm, Isn't it wrong though? You, you want me to do what? <laughs> but they they don't even they know come which servers yeah. talk to which servers. Mm -hmm. They can't tell you any of this stuff. So that's one of my questions. So, the, okay, the, so, the, so hang on, okay. let, me, let me kind of outline. <laughs> do if you have two questions, I'll, I'll lose them all. Because you may have one sentence that covers everything. All right. All right, so you also have this bit engine that runs. What happens at t equals zero? You have no data. So okay. I'll tell you what. So, so that's that's another one. Is is what that's happens to G equals well. zero because well, you know, anything could talk to anything. <laughs> okay, but you have no data. So how do you know what? We build a balanced topology. Links. Okay. With no data, we build a balanced topology, which okay. means all these links that Marty showed you about, they're all available for everyone, and the traffic is balanced. Okay. All right. So. <laughs> so you've got. If you look at the capacity that's there, oh, oh, I understand. tremendous I understand. amount of capacity. Okay. I, I got it. But when we learn over time the traffic matrix, then. <laughs> All right, so I'm, I'm also, I'm the pointy haired boss. Oh, everything can be protected from everything. Oh, Isolated. Yeah, right. Everything should be protected from everything. Configure it that way. Okay, and Dilbert's sitting over there going, oh, that doesn't work. <laughs> and you kind of hinted to that just a minute ago. So what happens when pointy hair boss says everything has to talk to everything and it all has to be isolated? Well, so we're customers that have that. Need. We we do need to train the pointy hair boss a little bit. I mean, I understand he might say I, I absolutely want this. He's his rings can get pretty pointy headed boss. His he's rings can get pretty big at that point. <laughs> Every single flow has to be on their own isolated link. I mean, it's, a, it's a big plexi ring. Okay, so I don't mind necessarily, but we, we do have to do a lot of, with this whole concept, we have to do a lot of customer training. This is, a lot of this is new, so people have not worked in this world before. Okay, so, so we're giving them tools which are, which are fun. Okay, so you're, you're kind of filling in a little bit of the, the stuff here. Um, so Terry, can, so, I, can, I, can I address the first question that you had? Because I think that actually gets to something that's pretty interesting. Well, I, I wanted to kind I of... I covered that on... Let, let him ask his question. Okay. Cover, cover <laughs> what my areas of confusion are. Right, if you drill down on one, we don't have time to get to all of them. And like I said, you may have, oh, here's your confusion. <laughs> okay, so you talked about 40 affinities. I may not have anywhere close to that small a number. How about a million affinities? <coughs> I'm in a big damn data center. I may have a million flows easily. I may have a million flows per second. Tell me about scale at, at, you know, at those kinds of numbers. Um, and okay, so the fit thing says I'm going to go out and harvest this data from other sources, but it's t equals zero. How do I balance, know how to reach those value. other sources? Okay, so <laughs> that's kind of all the questions that I have bottled up here. <laughs> The guys at the back don't want to answer anything. <laughs> I, just want, I just want to make sure he has a chance to ask his questions before we talk over. Well, you keep telling me I've got less than a minute left, so. Okay. <laughs> yeah, if you if you so, if so you so you the, answered one question, which is you just kind of lay down a default set of, of, of connectivity at t equals zero, and then you start looking at the traffic. So how frequently does the fit run at that point, or should I run the fit at that point? It's, I mean, it's totally up to you. You can automate it so it runs once a day, maybe once a week, maybe once an hour. I mean, we, we're allowed to be basically. So, so, so the switches operate as a standard network, so they'll start, you know, doing switching and routing like they like they would do, right? But the, the the act of doing the fit is say, well, I could do better, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I may want to do better. So if I've collected some data, maybe I should look at that and then do a fit, right? Um, so it's it's really up to you if you want to say, okay, maybe I could balance this traffic. Uh, better based on the, the data patterns that I see. Right? None of that requires any of the harvested information. Okay. So, so the the, the, yeah. the point about harvesting and Simon mentioned that is making like, more rich. First, an affinity is not a flow, right? An affinity is a relationship, right? So, right. you may have a million flows, but that doesn't mean you have million million affinities, right? Mm -hmm. What what the okay. affinity is is a relationship that I care about. 
It might be to, you know, from an app server to a database server. It happens to be, and if you think about kind of what's the normal workflow when you set up a network? You, you design your network, you kind of talk to your app guys, get a general idea of what you need to do. They don't know. I they, can well, tell you that. <laughs> they may say, look, this, we're running high performance application, whatever. You get some general sense, right? You build a network, and then what do you do? You, you, you wait for the phone to ring, right? You say, okay, my application's not working anymore, it must be the network, right? And, and, and then what are your tools at that point? You know, Tom, Trace, right? right? So what we're saying, well, you have a, a rich tool set here. You can say, okay, let me understand what your application is. Let me point you to a repository of information. Maybe it's vCenter, maybe it's uh, Libbird, maybe it's something else. But let, help me understand that update. Let, help me model it. And once I model it, then I can say, well, what are, what are the constraints you have for this application? Is it delay sensitive? Is it, does it need a lot of bandwidth? And then I can do that, right? I don't have to, you know, and so you can think about this as a standard network model, but except I have now a set of advanced tools to go understand what applications need. So it doesn't have to be thought about in the, oh, I gotta learn everything to, to you know, to, to do anything, right? But, you know, we, and we have an integration um, like existing today, and this is just one of them, and it, and it was done in Python, actually. So th this is within reach with other tools, not just Boundary. But with Boundary now, you can actually document those relationships. Yeah. And it, it'll self-document. Yeah. And that that is enormously powerful. Being able to self-document what's happening on the, not just the topology, but what is actually happening on the network. Boundary puts an agent in your servers, so your Windows and your Linux, and then it tracks every single flow, creates micro records, which are then exported into a cloud run them through a big data app and they can actually tell you create a complete flow map in the application from the from the NIC driver. It sounds like another way to do what Autonet does in packets. Yeah. It, well, yeah. yeah. But it does it in so from my point of view I'm building a cloud and my VMs could be anywhere on a VM on a hypervisor anywhere, any right. point. So I need that ongoing app I could I don't it need I could, more thorough coverage. I could wish for that sort of analysis so that I could then retune my network you know, by feed by closing the feedback loop. So we talked at Brocade about open loop mm -hmm. feedback systems. That is, there is no feedback. You, you you make a change and there's no feedback to tell you. Right. Whereas when we in OSPF we make a change, we see the feedback in that the we see the update to the root and tell we want to change the OSPF root and code. Close feedback loops. Systems like Boundary close the feedback loop. For Flexi, so that they can then say, well, this is what this is the data paths across the network. Now we can reconverge around those data paths, derive the affinity table, and forward data according. You know, reconfigure the, the bandwidth dynamically and change it. So, hang on, I've got you know, for example, somebody's just deployed a Hadoop cluster, and they've taken 20 nodes out of my VMs, and I need to suddenly find a whole bunch of bandwidth for, to support that, and I need to make a change. Well, that's something that this type of feedback loop can create. I'd like to see that because I've been wondering about somewhat the same problem uh, because we've both seen the same situation. I've watched one organization spend, take this $500,000 tool and spend a whole day mapping one application that consisted of 20 servers. Yeah. And after you do that for your top 10 applications, they give up because it's too labor intense. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? It's actually, and, and it's actually, um, it's actually worse than that. I was in financial um, for a long time, and what security people don't like to hear is, I don't know what these servers are doing. Yeah. <laughs> they don't like to hear that, right? They're like, well, something got hacked. Well, what are the data flows left? Why would I care about the data? What? I don't know. Network guys don't know because they build for universal reachability. They turn up a port, and if you put packets in that port, it's going to get to the other side of the network. They don't care what's coming out of the server. The app guys don't know, don't care what their tools do. The libraries they load, the frameworks they use, the OSs they build on, they have no clue what those things are doing on the network. And security people don't like that, right? And it, it, so not just for resources, but having a tool like this that will tell you what is happening in the network so you can self-document those flows is enormously powerful. I wanted to build on Terry's scaling question a little bit. Um, what are you seeing customers do in really large environments? Are they building gigantic single rings, or are they building multiple smaller rings and then federating them somehow? Uh, right now we're seeing multiple small rings. I don't know about federating, but they're multiple small rings. So. So, and how do they interconnect the two? And is there intelligence? Do they know about each other? Is the control and know about multiple rings? Uh, that there? So, 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 so you can, you can, in a way you can look at them as you can stack them. Um, 
and so they do know about each other. So you can, you can create n connections between two rings. They'll realize that they're talking to another Plexi ring, and they'll smartly distribute traffic across all the interconnects between them. So you, you, can, you can take a ring, take another ring next to you, you can get you know, like, okay, I'm going to use 810 GDs to connect these. And you'll realize that there's another Plexi ring on the other side, and we'll use those 810 GDs and distribute the traffic based on destination MAC address in this case, but we'll distribute the traffic evenly across those eight. And in that case, the affinity kind of exists within, within each ring, and then we distribute traffic evenly. What we're talking about with the roadmap, when we optically connect with things, we can have the affinity stretch across n number of rings, right? And, and you can create that model. You don't have to care about what ring assistance. And, and you can keep stacking rings. Just stack them on top of the or right, I mean, or you can t you can take sort of like the the like, I'm going to take a ring, I'm going to take a traditional big honking router, stick it in the middle, right? Have a bunch of uplinks from one ring to a big honking router and down to another ring, right? That's totally legitimate as well. So, so two quick things. So the reason we talk about boundary a lot, we did a partnership with them. Uh, you know, one of the first things we ran into was um, you know your question, right? I I don't have telemetry data. I haven't right. instrumented my network. Um, and, and the reason we, can, we architect and control this way is you don't actually have to have a lot of data. You can just say, I don't know what it needs. I just know that it's bandwidth sensitive or it's like it's hop count sensor, things like that. And, and that, that's enough for us. It's kind of fuzzy logic enough for us to go at least say, hey, we know that this has some certain requirements and we'll, go, we'll use that. Now, if you want to actually you know, uh, instrument your, your network, right, you have a couple of choices. You can go buy probes and stick them on. You know all your links or in certain places. Uh, the nice thing we've liked about Boundary is that it's a, it's a simple download. You, you, you instrument it basically collects up, uh, uh, or pumps up IP fix data up to a SAS offering, and you know literally within minutes you're starting to see a data model start, starting being built. So and you don't have to instrument your entire network. You might just say, hey, I just want to see what this application is doing. I download meters to these you know these ten servers. Uh, I go point my browser at, at a web page and I start to see. I get a, I get a better idea of what you know, what that application might be, and maybe I, I'll see that, hey, it's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, we actually did this for the Boundary application itself, which is uh, kind of like a, it's a, basically a web app uh, with some big data uh, capabilities. So there's, you know, there's a component that does, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's certain pieces that have lots of data uh, correlated between them. So we saw that, and we said, okay, now we can build that, it, it, you know, we take that information and use that to build infinity, so. Um, the other, the other, sorry, no. So what do you typically see, we're talking about the scaling here with number of energy, what do you typically see in a, a real deployment? Well, they, they, they start off with low number of affinities, and I think that's, they've not started on affinitizing everything. Because of the problem you say, they, they just don't have a good feel for their profile of traffic. The fit, make, fit engine automatically determines affinities based on traffic levels. Yeah. Uh, it's only what, you, only what we feed into it through that affinity group. <coughs> So, so affinities, affinities are not automatically generated. Right? Ah, so okay. affinities, affinities are imposed on top of topologies, but the topologies that we calculate are independent. Right? Affinities are something that comes from the outside. It's you or some third party that needs to feed us what they are. But for regular forwarding between your million flows, you don't need a single affinity. Just go. It's forwarding. All we, all that control is provided is the switch with, here's the topology of how to forward that. Not a single affinity. You don't need a single affinity for your network to forward across all those links that are available. Okay, so that's different than what I was hearing earlier. Because I heard there was almost like a fully automated tiering mode, which is exciting to me. So, what I might what I might have missed is the fact that you can make an affinity that is more of a policy. Is that true? Yeah. And it will effectively look for those criteria and then apply. So, if you see two people talking, you know, within X distance, you do this with them. So, so, so an affinity is not necessarily just a one to one relationship. It can be a policy group. Correct. But it's, I mean, it's but configured it's, on the switches, so the switches know about it when they see, see that the, the, the thing to remember, right, so Plexi Control yes. is a programmable entity, yep. right? And so you can have, you program nothing, in which case it will talk to the switches, determine topologies, and will find the best way to balance the traffic across those links, or you can feed it smart information. You can feed it smart information from vCenter. You can write a script that interacts with boundary, grabs stuff and automatically provisions affinities and then applies those, right? So that, that there is a mechanism to create that feedback. There's something I've taken from this whole week so far and actually from the kind of esteem thing in general. It's the concept that I'm calling fully automated network tiering. We have fully automated storage tiering right now. And when you build a data center day one, it really doesn't matter because you just have this really big, fast architecture. But then the next gen comes, 
And it gives you the opportunity to then start creating tiers of network and tiers of service pools that aren't just storage, and, and, but also network as well. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot less rip and replace. So if you can create at least policies that can start doing that, even if it's not native, you can create the policy groups that are create affinities, that's powerful. It's not powerful today, it's powerful in five to eight years, so the rip and replace doesn't happen. So, so you, you absolutely can do that. Cool. The only thing I had left, I realize time is up. We have an interactive um, shell. I'm going to talk about this for about 30 seconds. So. I ran a couple of columns. Basically, there's a Python interface to that database. So you can get right down and dirty into the details of that topology model. When you can get down and dirty, you can then start scripting everything. We provide a bunch of high-level commands as well. I showed you a couple where I wrote a bit of Python. I printed a bunch of switch names from the database, which is done every other day. And then I ran one of my high-level commands, which basically just printed me a summary. Um, because it's there in Python, then there's a lot of interactivity we can build into that, make it intelligent, and, and, and look deep into problems that you may be seeing. One of the clever things we do, and we've got to finish with this, because this, this is our finish, actually, is um, we can find MAC addresses, for example. So if I know a MAC address, I have a little find function, find MAC, okay? And if I define, if I know the name of a MAC, and I've got, a, I've got one I stored earlier, And I can basically find that MAC address. I don't know anything about it, but where it is. Hopefully it's going to work. No. <laughs> so it basically then uh, interrogates the, data, the database, um, tells you the MAC address. It's on Plexi Switch P06. It's on port 21. Port 21 is up. And here's a list of the harvested information I know about the MAC address, because I got this from VMware. So I know the host name, nickname, etc., etc. Now Derek arrived yesterday. I actually met Derek for the first time yesterday, right? And I showed him this because I was excited about it. He did? Yeah, I, you know, this, this is a cool thing I created. He said, well, how about if you could search for all Cisco Macs or all VMware Macs? I thought, well, I, do, I don't know how to do that, he said. And Derek said, well, I do. And I sent him a bit of code, and he sent it back to me. And then I wrote it. So do you want to come up, Derek? And sure. I suggest you do the VMware one. Yep. So if you do find tab, you'll see your command tab. Yeah, find Mac Derek. Yeah, there he is. I even called it Derek. Got to spell his own name right, and you've got to give it, give it VMware. Yeah. So now it's going to look through the topology and look for all the MAC addresses Ooh. that have got the VMware prefix in the MAC address. There's quite a few of them. That's the Plexi switch. It's on again. This is the MAC address. It's Web Server <coughs> Three is a, cool. the VMware. That's so your CLI is Python, and if you don't like what's already there, just write your own CLI commands in Python. In one place. In one place. Yep. And what you do here has a network-wide view. And the hook that you guys have with VMware, which is cool, which is kind of what um, Arista did with VM Tracer, taking the next level. When you have what Arista did and what you guys do, you don't need fabrics then. You don't need things like is it the UCS fabric. You can take much more generic things and start treating the network infrastructure as a fabric. That's what I did with my environment. And that's, it's really powerful. So do we have time for just a quick closing statement? Yes. Okay. So thank you all, first of all. Uh, one of the things that, you know, uh, and, and this came up a little bit about automation. We're actually going to be opening up the Affinity language. Uh, it's, a, it's actually completely generic of anything Plexi. Um, it just allows you to describe what your application components are and what they might need from the infrastructure. So we're actually going to make that available to the community. It'll be a GitHub site. We'll launch, launch it in, uh, you know, a week or two or something fairly soon, um, and uh, you know, our view, our vision is kind of as we orchestrate applications in the future, you know, I do uh, V apps or I do OpenStack or something like that, we can start to build this knowledge, the affinity knowledge, into the orchestration layer. Um, and that, that's when we kind of get to the vision of everything's fully automated, because now I've encoded metadata at the orchestration layer that says what my affinities are. Uh, and then any types of, of physical infrastructure, ours is already built to kind of take advantage of that, but any type of physical infrastructure has essentially information, metadata about that application that it can use. So uh, that is something you should look for from us. So. And that's it. All right. Very good.